Hey, thanks, Jason. I uh, just want to say thanks to you and, and the SANS team for putting this together. It's a pleasure to join everyone. Uh, just to introduce Michael briefly, uh, been lucky enough to have worked with him uh, for just about two years now. Uh, he has more than 10 years of hands-on experience in industrial cybersecurity uh, and especially compliance activities. Prior to joining Nexus Controls, he worked in the electric utility space as a cybersecurity engineer and network admin. Uh, his responsibilities at that time included regulatory compliance, of course, having implemented a framework to meet the requirements for NIST 853 and NEI 0809, um, where uh, policy and procedure development were top of mind, and he had day-to-day -day oversight of security infrastructure tools. Uh, he's got a bachelor's uh, in electrical engineering from Lake Superior State University. Uh, and again, my name is Robert. I'm a security engineer at Tripwire, and I focus on helping our customers secure their industrial control systems. I've got 18 years experience in cybersecurity, uh, eight of those most recently working in OT roles, uh, most recently, I was in the electric utility sector also by chance, where I implemented NERC Critical Infrastructure Protection, or SIP, uh, internal compliance program. And uh, while at that utility, I worked in OT to support SCADA uh, across the organization and distribution transmission generation. That being said, uh, thanks for letting us introduce ourselves. Today, we're going to be talking about design and implementation of uh, OEM ICS cybersecurity frameworks. Let's see if I can get the slide to advance. Oh, and this seems to be happening to everyone. Let's see if it goes to the next one. There we go. <clears throat> so just a brief, brief walkthrough on the agenda. Uh, we're gonna walk through uh, what I see as kind of the problem here, uh, and I'm calling it the needle in the haystack conundrum. Uh, we're gonna do a quick introduction to industrial cybersecurity frameworks, and we'll keep it brief because they've been uh, components of the talks up to this point in time. Uh, then I'm gonna turn it over to Mike, and he's gonna talk about uh, what exactly the Baker Hughes Nexus Controls approach is to customizing a CSF. And then lastly, we'll just talk about uh, a solution. So uh, early on in my industrial cybersecurity career, I was posed uh, with a challenge by management based on some recently published CVEs uh, that had made its rounds uh, on back then the ICS cert notifications and uh, had also gained visibility of the CISO at the time. And I was, you know, as the new guy asked to determine uh, the scope and implications of that particular CVE, kind of like a, a rite of passage for the new guy um, to find, you know, what vulnerability uh, or what this vulnerability uh, and its effect were on, on a bunch of protection relays. Um, and this vulnerability, like so many others out there, enabled a remote attacker to execute a denial of service. Uh, being new, again, to that organization, I th thought, well, first, you know, let me find out where they keep their asset list. Uh, and then I got a, a smirk every time I, I asked the, the, the folks that question. Um, you know, looking for, you know, make model version so I could find out what exactly was impacted. And not surprisingly, I quickly discovered that uh, it doesn't exist. It didn't exist. Uh, and soon thereafter, uh, I realized it'd be a massive undertaking to, to patch. You know, this, these systems are, you know, not like your average, uh, you know, uh, HR workstation. Uh, you got to take an outage to, in order to patch this stuff. Um, and of course, in the same fashion, no vulnerability management programs in place to even handle it. So yes, it's like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Um, as is typical with vulnerabilities like this, the vendor uh, that, that you know, uh, published the, um, the vuln recommended a few potential mitigating measures that could be implemented to reduce exposure. And you know, one that really stood out to me referred to some steps that could be taken to harden the affected devices. And I thought, well, bingo, now, now we're onto something. If I can't patch this thing, maybe I can at least harden it. And you know, at this point, without knowing even the scope of my affected assets and not knowing the state of the system hardening setting that that vendor recommended, um, it's, it's truly like, uh, trying to find many needles in many haystacks 
And so looking back at it now, it was like uh, so many, I was like so many others in, in this uphill battle of the security configuration management learning curve. And I ultimately discovered that the single setting I was seeking out this status of was just one really small piece of that larger SCM or security configuration management puzzle. Uh, there are many hundreds, uh, many thousands, if many, if not many hundreds of thousands of possible configuration items across a whole enterprise that are probably worthy of some kind of status monitoring and uh, you know detecting change in an ICS environment came up during the last talk and I think this really aligns well with that. Um, and clearly somebody smarter than me has have to have designed and documented standardization on implementing hardening in environments like this. And really that's what takes us to um, the industrial cybersecurity frameworks. Uh, and during Jason's keynote this morning, uh, a couple of points that he made really resonated with me. He said, and I'll try and paraphrase as, as best as the notes I could take were, are, um, he said, as standards, uh, even as good as they are, they don't accommodate every scenario. But when you select a standard, you go through each control and understand uh, exactly what it means for that control to be implemented. And not every control needs to be addressed and some may impact your posture more than others. And lastly, he said, orchestrating standards across teams is important. Don't just push them down, but coordinate and prioritize. And I think that really hit the nail on the head. So keep those points in mind as we do a quick intro to some industrial cybersecurity frameworks. So this is just a sampling. Uh, there are many more out there, um, but I, I, I handpicked uh, these to kind of go through here. And, once again, I, I'm a victim of the, the SANS uh, uh, PowerPoint formatting, but that's, that's okay. Um, notice that I kind of jumped them or lumped them, excuse me, into two categories uh, with the, the second and third columns there. Uh, and and there was, those are regulated and non-regulated. What I mean by that is, you know, uh, if you're subject to uh, the government enforcing via hefty fines, that, that means you're, you're, you're regulated and you must comply with these standards. And examples of those here are NEI 0809, which is for the nuclear industry, and uh, NERC SIP, which came up earlier today, and uh, being one of the reasons why the electric utility industry uh, might be you know, slightly ahead of the rest of, of the folks in the industrial verticals because they're required to do so. And, you know, all of these that I, I, I sampled from are purpose-built for industrial control system unique environments, uh, their reliability taking into account and safety. Uh, and some do a better job than others and, and there's no surprise there. Um, you know, and worthy I think of honorable mention, especially for this audience, is the fact that the API or American Petroleum Institute has standard uh, 1164 in draft form, which is of course specific to pipeline security uh, and is uh, purportedly complementary to IEC 62443, which we see here. And the last time I checked on that one, it's still uh, incomplete in the pre-ballot phase. So it's the reason I didn't include it in the table. But uh, for this uh, audience, I'll focus on the non-industry specific uh, requirements uh, of the four I listed here. I'll, we'll go in a, a deep, deeper dive into two of them. Okay, that one got uh, really messed up. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we'll just try and talk through it, even though the text got over the table here. But uh, the NIST cybersecurity framework and the 800 series specifically uh, is used as a foundation for many other frameworks. And I think even that was mentioned earlier today. And that's why I chose to touch on NIST 882 um, because uh, it has a, a really wide applicability with no vertical specialization. So uh, it's no surprise that it provides guidance on how to improve the security in industrial control systems, including SCADA, uh, DCS, and other control system configurations that contain PLCs, while addressing what really are the unique performance, reliability, and safety requirements I mentioned earlier. So special publication 82 uh, provides an overview first and foremost, uh, and provide some typical system topologies. It identifies typical threats to organizational missions and business functions. And third, 
uh, describes typical vulnerabilities. Uh, and, and not just because I work at Tripwire, I'm rather fond of the last uh, component that it covers, which is providing recommended security controls, which are really safeguards and countermeasures to respond to associated risks, just like that vulnerability I talked about earlier. So same, same problem with this one. And you know, the second one I wanted to briefly cover is uh, ISA 62443, which is a series of standards, technical reports, and related information that define procedures for implementing um, electronically secure industrial control systems. And for reasons I won't debate here, uh, this framework is unfortunately not freely available. But you know, if your organization has chosen or is even considering to adopt ISA 62443, Kudos to you, you know, making an investment means that your organization is committed to an implementation, and I think that's pretty cool. Um, and you support, of course, what is a great organi organization. Uh, so this guidance applies to, to a whole bunch of different groups. Uh, end users, you know, who is the asset owner, which would be uh, hopefully the vast majority of our audience today. Uh, the systems integrators, security practitioners, and uh, even the control system manufacturers, that are responsible for you know, manufacturing, implementing, or managing an ICS. Um, and the, you know, just so there's no confusion out there, they, these were originally referred to as like ISA 99. Um, and so there's, there is some history there with that numbering change. So if you see that out there, that, that's what it's referring to. So um, before I, I turn it over to Mr. Zavislak, uh, I wanted to touch on a topic uh, that I hear all the time, and that is compliance is not security. And I got lucky during some insomnia last night while browsing, browsing the depths of the interweb. And, and when I came across uh, an article by a guy who goes, goes by PCI Guru, uh, he's got a Word, WordPress blog, check him out. Uh, but he, he rather succinctly addressed uh, the... Uh, the the mantra that compliance is not security. And he put it quite bluntly that the statement actually repul is repulsive to him. And he goes on to justify that the, the, the frameworks that we're talking about are and should be just the foundation for a good security program. And the starting point and comprehensive uh, security program is, is really, uh, you have to go well beyond just the language of, of any of these framework requirements. And, Ultimately, uh, compliance with any security framework means that your organization can execute the basics consistently. And I'll, I'll quote the next part directly from his blog. He said, the next important point I'd like to make to people who spew this trope is that if they read any of the data breach or security reports from the likes of Verizon, Trustwave, Security Metrics, or any other recognized security company, what do you see? that the organizations breached could not comply with any of the recognized security frameworks, be it PCI, DSS, COBIT, NIST, HIPAA, pick your poison. Unfortunately, as these reports point out, in annoying detail, organizations rarely execute the basics consistently, because if they did, they would likely not have been breached, which really punches a huge hole in the whole compliance does not equal security argument. Uh, enough said. I think, I think he, he put that uh, really well. So I'll turn it over to Mike now. Thanks, Mike. Hey, I'm gonna uh, go ahead and just share the original slide deck quick um, for the remainder of this presentation, just so we don't have the same formatting issues. Um, so give me just a second to do that for you, Michael, and then yeah. um, I'll give you mouse control. Okay, Mike, I'm gonna go on mute and then give you mouse control, okay? Okay, thank you. Um, I think mine should be okay in presentation mode. Yeah. Okay, so um, as Robert alluded, um, my name is Mike Zavislak, work with uh, Baker Hughes Nexus Controls. Um, Dustin, it doesn't look like it's letting me uh, advance the slides. Um, so what, what uh, Robert and them had asked me to come and, and talk to everybody about today um, is give some perspective on 
what OEMs consider uh, when developing and looking at frameworks. Um, how do we leverage that consideration to help customers meet their compliance objectives? And I wanted to talk briefly about some common challenges that we see uh, within that space when executing on these, uh, implementing these framework uh, requirements uh, from an OEM perspective and then how we help customers uh, meet those framework requirements as well. So just to briefly touch on, you know, when, when, when as an OEM, when we're looking at these different frameworks that exist within the space, you know, similar to how you would develop for a, a customer system or, a, you know, your own environments, we have a structured and methodical approach for looking at the frameworks, looking at feature requests, looking at the different requirements um, and making decisions on which ones of those requirements are the most impactful and then integrating those. Um, just as an example, uh, Nexus Controls has chosen the 62443 standards as one of our primary compliance objectives. And so we've worked, uh, worked through and are working through our uh, 3.3 compliance requirements and our 2.4 uh, compliance requirements. And so similar to how you would need um, to be able to have a process defined to look at these uh, regulation changes, uh, policy changes, procedure changes, we, we, would, we have a similar process internally that allows us um, to evaluate these different requirements and integrate them within our product space. Um, you know, from an OEM, when we're looking at all the different requirements, you know, we're a global company. So we have a large subset of uh, requirements that we have from all of our different customer sets. Um, so, you know, we have global requirements, country specific requirements, industry specific frameworks um, that we continuously evaluate and look at and maintain visibility into through our regional teams. Uh, to provide us feedback as we're continuing to look at the development of how do we implement these frameworks within our products and with our security offerings within our control system environments, whether we're providing a retrofit or a new, uh, a new system, how do we best implement these technologies? And then for, from an OEM perspective, understanding what you as the customers need um, to be able to integrate those requirements within our, our solution stack so that when the product arrives, it already has these uh, requirements baked in and integrated so that it's easy. Uh, easy to use, you know, understanding from the perspective of, you know, are we leveraging this tool for a maintenance personnel at the site or an operations personnel to be able to use this, or is this more of a tool that we're looking for a security solutions uh, architect to be using in the, in, in the back end as they're doing it. And so this, this allows us to make sure that the products and technologies and control requirements that we're implementing um, allow us to meet your end requirements and the end needs. Um, and then you know, looking at continuous uh, lifecycle management of our own solutions, right? In integrating new cybersecurity features and functionalities, being forward looking on, on trends in the industry, um, staying vigilant of the different threat within the life, uh, within the life cycle of our products. And, and all of this being done, uh, you know, to ensure the safe and reliable operation of the control systems that we have in place. And so how do we continue to adapt to the standards, adapt to our landscape, and then uh, maintain and ensure that there's the proper reliable operation of our control systems in their space. So what does, um, oh. so what does, uh, I'm sorry, Dustin, can you send me back a few slides? I apologize for that. It looks like it's advancing me. Um, back to the OEM integration challenges. Yep, thank you. So what are our challenges within the space as we're trying to implement these framework requirements? You know, as you know, there's numerous different technical solutions that exist within the space. So as an OEM trying to look at all those different solutions, trying to look at the emerging threats and develop and determine um, which the best solutions are. So one of our mantras, uh, you know, as Nexus controls is you produce, we protect. And so we're, we're making sure that we're looking at all these uh, different technical solutions, all of these different framework requirements and trying to find commonality across those requirements and solutions that can help us meet those requirements. And as an example, working with Tripwire, um, you know, the, the product solution Tripwire Enterprise has helped us uh, to better get visibility into the framework requirements uh, in a rapid manner to understand our compliance status, where we may be able to make improvements and then continuously update and monitor those compliance as they change. So giving us a, a rapid example of, for a multiple uh, sets of customers so that we're then able to provide a solution where they can monitor compliance with their specific frameworks. And then tailoring, um, can we tailor these solutions to better serve? So can we take that solution and then knowing our environment, knowing our, our capabilities within the control space and specifically knowing how our systems operate, how do we tailor those solutions to best represent uh, our capabilities within that framework requirement? 
and then performing you know, uh, selection, integration, validation testing of all the different solutions that, that we're looking to incorporate within our space. Obviously, you know, again, operation, safe, reliable operation of the control system uh, is paramount within our space. And so uh, you know, making sure we're selecting products and uh, partners that have technologies that will be reliable um, and that we can test within our, our lab environment, uh, both initial implementation and continuous testing as we move forward um, with updates and things like that. And then, you know, are there solutions within the space that we can provide that would help not only meet a security challenge, but also an operational challenge? So understanding how, you know, your return on investment for these different solutions, these different integrations, these different frameworks that we build within our products, how can those be used for you to be able to, you know, um, get compliance and get buy-in from your stakeholders at your sites. You know, it's, it's challenging sometimes uh, bringing a security solution into the OT space that's primarily driven by, uh, you know, continuous operation. You know, we've seen a change as time has gone on that security has become more and more important, obviously, but that, um, you know, there's still some hesitation sometimes to introduce new technologies, new solutions within the space. And so how do we manage that? And how do we provide, um, you know, input to, to customers who are looking to leverage these solutions to help buy, get stakeholder buy-in? And then, like we had touched on before, you know, again, integration of these different frameworks and challenges within our control space. How do we ensure that, you know, the safe, reliable operation of our process control system uh, is not interfered with while we can provide the most secure solution? And then evaluating all these different framework requirements and implementing the most secure subset of them for our space and also identifying areas where you may be able to make changes based on your customer uh, specific requirements and changes. So just as an easy example, you know, we have a baseline password uh, length and complexity requirement that's able to be modified, you know, obviously once we provide the system based on the customer specifications. And I'll briefly touch on how we can make sure that we're meeting those requirements so that when a system is deployed at your site, we're meeting the maximum set of your, your framework requirements and security requirements. And then our lifecycle management, again, continuing to validate, test, um, and ensure that the solutions we're providing are secure, um, you know, updates for those solutions, and then continuing to move forward and integrate additional technologies. Um, how do we keep those current in, in our space? So what are, some of the, what are some of the shared challenges that we see um, when working on integrating um, frameworks within our, our space and when we're working on uh, customer projects um, you know, we see a lot of uh, proprietary requirements that may come, you know, you've developed some in-house standards based on the global framework standards. So, uh, uh, you know, we work our best to integrate the most commonly, uh, common standards and the most common requirements out of those standards. Um, but sometimes it can be challenging when we're presented with uh, a different, a deviation from those standards based on your security policy. Um, so how do we work together to make sure that when you, the system is delivered to you, uh, we're able to understand where those deviations may be, where we're able to make changes to help better implement your framework requirements, and then how can we help with um, best practices. Another challenge that, that's kind of a shared challenge within it is, um, you know, due to the large scope of different solutions, different security solutions within the space, um, you know, a lot of customers have different tools that they use across their environments, regional specific tools, global tools. Um, you know, it's challenging uh, for us as an OEM and challenging uh, you know, for customers to understand, can we use that tool on your process control system? What does the testing and validation look like? Um, and that touch, touches on the next point, but what does that look like for us to validate that solution to go into that environment and ensure no, you know, no adverse impact on the, on the process control system? And then what does the lifecycle management look like for that tool? Uh, you know, we would we're challenged uh, just like all, all of it to, you know, we're not able to support every single tool that lives within the space. However, we are able to provide guidance on how you may be able to test and maintain and continuously uh, leverage that tool within your space and best practices that we use when doing our implementation and testing. So a shared relationship there, um, you know, and some tools may be more impactful than other tools and uh, just part of the project um, implementation. And then, you know, consideration of what, what are your policy and procedure requirements look like. So technical solutions are, are great. Um, you know, we have a lot of technical solutions. We have a lot of hardening and implementation things that we're able to do. But um, can we select partners and solutions that will also help meet expected policy and procedure requirements? So as, a, as an OEM provider, you know, we're, we're implementing, we're integrating, we're doing technical solutions on our control platforms. 
but there's a myriad of other requirements that go along with these frameworks about reporting, log retention, all of these other requirements that are uh, policy and procedure type things. Um, you know, we heard it talked about earlier about building that baseline for those policy, uh, policy and procedures internally for how you're gonna continuously manage and develop your cybersecurity program and, and maintain it throughout its life cycle. So um, is, there, is there technologies and partners that we can choose that um, again, would help you implementing those policy and procedure requirements, even though we as a, as a OEM provider are not responsible for those once the system has been uh, implemented at your site. So what does, what does a successful framework um, implementation look like on a project? And again, I, I'm, I'm going specifically down to implementing a project. So we've talked about how uh, we as an OEM evaluate the different framework requirements, how we stay current, how we integrate technologies now it comes down to we're, we're, in, we're stepping into a project and, and what does that look like to be successful in that project and implementing your uh, specific framework requirements uh, that you may have that may deviate from the standards that, that we've already integrated. So, you know, early engagement, we talk about it always, but bring up those concerns and considerations related to cybersecurity up front. Uh, we don't, you know, we don't wanna cause uh, delays uh, by not understanding or not being clear on what we're implementing. Um, you know, we, we get a better outcome and lower risk on project execution when we're able to understand specific areas. Um, early notice of, of specialized testing uh, required during the execution. So typically, you know, we, we do perform our own internal testing. We have a FAT, um, but what we've seen in the space is requests for additional testing, additional proprietary scans, um, you know, notification of those things early and upfront so that we can help stage those, um, do some pre pre-fat work while we're doing our project development to make sure we understand where there may be potential challenges and, and areas that we can make modifications to the system during test so that when we provide the system, um, you know, we're implementing as many of your framework requirements as we can while not degrading the operation and um, while not missing any of missing yours, you know, showing up, um, potentially showing up and asking to do a test and then having to go through and um, look at, you know, are we going to have to use compensating or mitigating factors to implement that requirement since we weren't able to do the testing. So it's very helpful um, to know that testing up front, we've seen very good success with that when we were informed and able to do that testing. Um, you know, a, a clear scope and expected outcomes related to your framework requirements that may deviate. Again, we primarily are looking at 62443 as one of our um, framework objectives. However, we also consider, you know, the NIST framework the NEI frameworks, the NERC SIP framework. So we have a lot of, of these frameworks that we're looking at and understanding how our product maintains or helps maintain compliance with those frameworks. Um, but again, making sure we understand what your expectation is at the start of the project. And then um, again, we talked about briefly, but the shared challenge of, are there any uh, specific framework requirements that you have that we may have not implemented on our system that we, we would need to make an adjustment or a change to during project execution and, and what do those look like? You know, if we know up front what they are, we can do a pre-evaluation and, and get up front, you know, understanding of yes, we think we can make these changes or no, these changes we've we've identified that could be a, a you know degradation of the operation or are not a recommended change uh, to the system configuration. So, what are some uh, briefly touching on? What are some lessons learned? Um, you know, we we talked about uh, depending on the exact space that you're you're working in, you know. Don't try and reinvent the wheel. You know, your partnerships are valuable. So whether that be an industry working group, whether that be uh, a vendor or an OEM uh, that you can leverage, you know, they have a lot of technical solutions. So you know your environment best. You know, you know what your framework requirements are. You know where you're sitting, um, but you may not have the exact solution. You know, there's a, there's a lot of, of your OEMs that are uh, willing and, and definitely interested to understand your, your challenge and then look and see if there's a way we can help meet the challenge as part of the project scope. And, and on that note, you know, maintaining a relationship. If you're seeing things that are coming within the space, uh, you know, regulation requirements or things like that, maintaining some feedback back to not only your, your OEM partners, but also your supplier partners, you know, uh, technology partners that you're using and giving them a heads up, even if it's as, you know, as simple as, hey, we see this regulatory requirement coming, we're, we're gonna need to be meeting it in the next three to five, you know, two to three years, three to five years, one to three years, whatever it may be. Um, that way we can get visibility into it early and work through our life cycle process to make sure we can start building those in. You know, we, we continuously are, are, you know, being as forward looking as we can, evaluating new and emerging technologies, um, understanding their potential role within our space and how we can best leverage those to help meet these different framework policy, procedure, and security requirements. 
Um, but you know, we do leverage that information that's provided back to help make enhancements and improvements to the control platform and to, to our security uh, integration platforms. And then you know, the last part's uh, you know, a fray, a, uh, implement frameworks in a phased approach. You know, bring that security in slowly and bring it in, um, in, a, in a manner that allows you to get the most stakeholder buy-in. Um, so yeah, I, I appreciate everybody and thank you very much uh, for your time. Um, with that, uh, Robert's gonna wrap up with a, a few slides. So thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate uh, all your insight, of course. Uh, we'll wrap it up briefly here uh, with just a quick introduction to some of the tripwire capabilities. And uh, this next slide is, is an eye chart. So uh, not intended for you to, to read through each, each of the product names here, but really just wanna give you an idea that there's a lot of solutions in the tripwire portfolio. And ultimately what we're trying to help you do is gain network visibility uh, by discovering and profiling all the assets that are on your network in both IT and OT, all the way from the shop floor to the top floor, so to speak, and get immediate security alerts for the quickest kind of resolutions. Uh, second, monitor your network status and systems for potential problems. Third, increase resiliency by avoiding plant disruptions by hardening systems like we've talked about today and detecting these misconfigured devices. Fourth, performing assessments uh, with Tripwire Professional Services who can do things like conduct granular vulnerability assessments to help gauge your ICS cybersecurity maturity. Uh, and today, again, we focus quite a bit on frameworks and at its core, Tripwire helps to promote the guesswork, or excuse me, help to remove the guesswork out of industrial cybersecurity policies and compliance requirements by uh, keeping up with the standards on your behalf, updating our content to match. Uh, following best practices and, and finding current threats uh, and even vendor alerts on ICS cert advisories and, and presenting them to you in, in a nice streamlined fashion. Uh, there's built-in templates and guidance for non-cybersecurity experts on what to do. And these are really a great starting point for prioritizing what's most critical to assure uptime and availability uh, of your assets. And this enables you to apply resources to the most urgent tasks and ultimately reduce overall cost of cybersecurity. And I uh, wanted to take a, a quick screenshot. Oops, I went too far. Let's see if I can go back one. Uh, previous. Maybe it's not gonna go. Enough said. Uh, that gives us about one minute for, for any questions if there are any. Um, and if, if we run out of time, feel free to drop them in the Slack. Mike and I will be hanging out there. And with that, turn it over to Jason. Wonderful. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I actually, I do have a couple of questions on Michael. I think the, you know, the topic you presented is, is something that I've, you know, I've, <laughs> um, struggled with for a while as far as trying to, um, you know, the early adoption of these, of anything security related earlier in the phase during a design and so forth. The first question I have is whether you feel the success rate of um, implementing that type of those type of items into a project. Do you find that they're more, less, or it doesn't matter as far as success when using either a, a design build process or a design bid build? So if I if I understand your question. Um, Correctly, you know, I think I think we've seen a lot more successes up front when we receive the the bid requests for the different jobs in those framework and structures are outlined um, within that within that requirement, so we can evaluate it and provide feedback up front. Um, where it gets a little more challenging for us, we've seen is uh, you know a more broad application of a, of a requirement. So where we're where we're a little challenged sometimes is you know we would like you to implement IEC six two four four three. Um, you know, understanding a little bit more, um, you know, we've had some requirements that have drilled down a little bit deeper and given us, these are the specific areas of 62443 that we're looking for compliance in. Um, you know, we, it, it helps us in understanding and, you know, when, when we do receive those larger requests, um, you know, we're having to respond to some of the policy procedure and, and requirements that, you know, are not necessarily applicable to us as an OEM. Um, but I, I would say we've, we've seen good success um, with more information up front, as you would expect with, you know, being able to execute and understand those requirements ahead of time. Yeah, that definitely is key. So if, if, do you find that um, 
uh, these sole source type projects or are these also where you're bidding it out and you're trying to compete? Because that's always been an area that's been kind of a, you know, especially if it's vague, right? Trying to compete when you have, you want to do the right thing and put it forward. So you either have to really sell yourself or, or do you find that it's, it's successful either way? I think, I think you've seen success both ways. It's, it's really, um, you know, incumbent on us as a, as a provider to make sure we define what scope of requirements are and, and clearly understand the, the requirements that are placed on us from our, from our customers as we're looking at these different projects, whether it's, a, like you said, a sole source uh, project or, a, you know, a multiple bid project where we're looking at the space and trying to best, you know, provide the most robust solution at, at the best target price point. You know, it's a, definitely a challenge um, looking at the different technologies and the different requests and then trying to articulate um, you know how these different solutions that we've integrated within our process system and tailored specifically to our process system can help meet these regulatory and, and compliance objectives and and um, you know so I, I think both we've seen very good successes in but again that understanding up front what what the technical requirements are it has seen much better project success right. when we're evaluating the bid scope yeah yeah yeah, so it's not, it's the point is it, it, they can't just dump it towards you and expect you to deliver a secure system. <laughs> so um, they, they have to be very specific. I mean, like I'm saying, like just it has to, like I've seen specs where it's like it must meet security and it's like one paragraph. If you're lucky, it's a sentence. And, you know, it's, it's just too vague. So your point is that, you know, the more specific outline, you know, so there's a clear indication. It's also easier to scope because then you can, you know, close those off. But yeah, um, the, the, the last thing I might, I'm, I know we're going over, but it, I just felt this was an important question. When going through these type of projects, um, do you find that the, are you self auditing? Do you use third party or even on the testing side, do you guys test in house Do you use third party or is it really up to the, up to the uh, end user? So, you know, us as a, us as a pro our own internal products, we do use third party testing, obviously, you know, for coming in and looking at our products. We also do internal testing, um, you know, for evaluation, vulnerability analysis, things like that on our, on our products and solutions. Um, and then on a, on a project specific requirement, we've seen a, a mixture uh, depending on the um, maturity of the different security, uh, security programs that we encounter. You know, we've had some individuals send their own teams in to do that testing as a supplement to our testing that we've done. Um, and then we've seen third parties, you know, requests for third parties to come in and, and do that same type of activity. So, you know, I, I think I touched on it, but it's it's very helpful to know upfront, um, you know, if that's a requirement for the project to make sure we can scope the appropriate project time, you know, cause it does add a little bit of cycle time to the execution. We have to get those people into our, into our facilities and allow them to do that testing um, in the manner which they see fit. So. But, but we've seen, you know, again, we do, you know, our internal testing, we have third party testing that comes in and looks at our offering, you know, I, I'd mentioned we're, we're, we work through our 62443 certifications, not only as a product, but as a supplier. So we're continuously trying to maintain that um, visibility into the different standards and maintain our, our products and offerings in, in adherence with those different standards um, and, and, you know, analyses. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, th thanks again, both of you for the presentation.